Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And today I have with me here Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh, my gosh. Landon, what are we talking? Why are we like all rainbows? Oh, my gosh. Like, what's going on? We're talking about two of my favorite topics. We're talking about gay and Harry Potter. <gasps> oh, my God. Yes. Um, you might. So if you were wondering why we're all rainbows in um, November, it's, like, it's not June, guys. You're not allowed to do rainbows outside of June. But guess what? Yes, we are. <laughs> do rainbows whenever we want. I'm that's not right. Turn off my queerness for you. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, um, so I've got uh, I've got Landon representing um, Slytherin and Gryffindor today, and I myself am representing Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff because in our world the houses are silly and everyone should be hanging out together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All um, right. Every, yeah. So let's let's get started. But first, uh, we haven't done this in a little while because we've had a lot of themed episodes. But mm. let's it's November. We're thinking of things that we're grateful for. So Karen, tell me something good that's happened to you this week. Some something you're thankful for or a favorite thing of this week, even if it's not in theme. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So just yesterday, the new Pokemon came out, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And I did try to stream it all day yesterday. Unfortunately, um, the game did give me simulation sickness, but I've been playing it handheld successfully. No problem. Uh, okay. It is simultaneously the best and worst Pokemon game I've ever played. I absolutely love it. Best gameplay ever. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of performance and graphical issues, hence the simulation sickness that I got yesterday, um, which make it so that it, it, it barely runs. It barely runs. It, they were a little too ambitious there, but um, I am really loving it. And I do plan after stream today. Well, I got to do a couple other things after stream, but um at some point, I am going to make a, a VC for us in the in the cafe for anybody else playing Pokemon. I know there are several of you. So if you are playing Pokemon, and you want to hang out with me, VC, you are welcome to come and uh, and use that VC and do that because I would love to play with you. There is some co-op stuff available in this game. So for this week, that is uh, that is what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful to have a, a new Pokemon game, even though it's a hot mess. <laughs> So yes. Um, uh oh, Landon is frozen. Oh no. Well, welcome in, Rar. How are you doing? As, as we wait for for Landon Zoom to to catch back up. Um, I know you were playing Pokemon too. You said you had someone had gotten it for you. Did you get Scarlet or did you get Violet? I got Violet personally, and um, I've gotten through about nine of the challenges. Landon, you're back. Hello. I am. I'm so sorry. Uh, Fox Spectrum. Fuck this spectrum is just gonna for be real. The, this is just going to be the mood for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. You got Scarlet. Okay, you got Scarlet. Awesome. Well, we will have to play together so that I can get your your versions exclusives and you can get my versions exclusives. So, so that's my favorite thing for this week. Landon, um, what was your favorite thing this week or something you're grateful for? I like that. I mean, I'm grateful for a lot of things, but I have to say, I'm going to do a shout out here. Uh, mm -hmm. For those of you who have watched the stream, uh, you know that I love a good Starbucks drink. Um, mm -hmm. And Starbucks actually went on strike this week. Uh, the workers at Starbucks were on strike. And so it was really fun to be able to support my friends who uh, were striking and over uh workers being able to join the union and the evil company that is Starbucks uh, asking them to actually come to the table for fair and open negotiation and from everything that I've heard the strike did make an impact so uh, we'll see there might be another one in the future and if so please support your local Starbuckses uh, if you don't know what's going on Starbucks workers are trying to unionize and a company doesn't want its employees to unionize because that usually <laughs> means that they have to pay more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of um, districts and stores for Starbucks have successfully unionized. So I'm so happy to hear that your um, area store or stores, I don't yeah. know if it's wh whether it's one or more, but I'm so happy to hear they're following suit. The ones that have done so have been very successful. Yeah, I think that this was a regional strike. Uh, over a hundred oh. store, over a hundred stores in New England went on oh. strike. Uh, so really hoping that 
that that will make an impact for for the stores all over here but uh, like I said I'm a Starbucks whore uh, which means that I've made a lot of friends in the place and it was just really cool to see that work and knowing that like there's a lot of things and a lot of power that we can change this evil capitalist hellscape that we live in Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we try. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, we have the power. We just have to exercise it. And, yes. uh, and, I, and I know it's hard. Not all of us can afford to strike. So when I see a group of workers getting together and being able to, to do that, it's always like really nice news. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. I hope, I hope that over the, uh, over the coming months or over the next year, as more and more Starbucks stores are doing that, I can say the same thing about my area Starbucks. Mm -hmm. um, not yet, but I, I hope to be able to in the future. I hope so too. So yes. it was just something that made me a smile a little bit and wanted to wear and raise awareness of. I love that. I love that. Yeah. If more unions happen, the easier it gets for everyone else. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. The more of us do it successfully, the more that are able to do it successfully. So it's a really uh, good thing. And just reminding people that unions hold companies accountable. They're one of mm -hmm. the few things that can and do. So really, really trying to get it involved in more places and in more stores and getting it like especially in the retail sphere and the food mm -hmm. in the food sphere would be awesome mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely all right well let's go ahead and get into it today we are having a harry potter fandom episode today we're gonna we're gonna be talk about we're gonna talk about gay stuff in harry potter okay <gasps> um before we do so though i just want to say the couple of normal things that we like to say at the beginning of our harry potter episodes this is not a spoiler free podcast this is a there will be spoilers for all of the wizarding world um you know and everything that has been released in regards to harry potter no holds barred on our harry potter discussion so if you're if you're at a certain point or aren't interested in spoilers for certain elements of the Harry Potter franchise, um, you know, then uh, then you can come back next week. We'll have something else. We'll have something else in the next episode. Also, um, oh, go ahead, Landon. I was going to say just also as a reminder, there might be heavy topics involved, including homophobia in this one, mm -hmm. because we know that JKR is not only a raging homophobic, but also a turf and mm -hmm. fuck turfs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely fuck turfs um so there might be we, triggering yeah. stuff and and harry potter itself as you know is, is all about cycles of abuse so that might easily come up as well if that's a problem for you then that's okay we'll see you later um and then last but not least just to make it clear for anybody that this is their first episode of ours that they're watching we do not support any of the bullshit JK Rowling posts on Twitter. We don't support TERFs. We don't support any of that. Um, so we will ask what we always ask is we would absolutely love your support and you're welcome to support us today in the same ways that you do for those of you guys that do support us. However, we would very much appreciate it if you took the money today that you had planned on spending on a sub or bits or anything like that and donate it to um, a fund that supports your local queer youth, particularly transgender youth. Trevor Project is our favorite one, but if you have a different favorite one, that's fine too. Um, so yeah, for any of our Harry Potter episodes, we do yeah. prefer that. And I'll just throw this out there to remind you that the holidays are coming up. So looking at local shelters and local uh, queer organizations in your mm -hmm. town or in the large city next to you will save lives this holiday mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. So really look into either volunteering your time or volunteering your money if you are willing and able to do so. Yep. And I don't know how it is in, in your area or any of our listeners areas, but, um, but in my area, you know, I'm in the deep South. We don't have a huge amount of, uh, of queer affirming organizations, but, um, our, our YMCA, funny enough, actually does quite a lot for our queer youth. So if you cannot find an appropriate organization in your area, you might just want to take a peek at what your Y is doing. They might be doing some mm -hmm. good stuff for the, for your queer youth. Absolutely. And there will always be like uh, funds around in almost any uh, major city mm -hmm. in the United States, even in more conservative areas Yes, uh, that will help directly help trans youth navigate this difficult time for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So um, the, the thesis of today, I'm going to give, give us a thesis statement. Okay. Harry Potter is queer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter is queer. That is, that is our thesis statement for everything that we're going to talk about today. And this is a special pet episode, I would say for Landon. So this is going to be a very um, Landon heavy episode. She had asked to make sure that we do um, a Harry Potter is gay episode, like way back last year. And, um, and we had always wanted to do it, but there was always something that was 
like, ah, oh, well, we actually really need to talk about this and we're not quite there yet. And, and, you know, there's other things that are more relevant to, to what we're talking about, which is, I, which is funny. We'll get into that in a little bit too, about why, kind of why that happened, but it's here finally. Harry Potter is queer. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, so Landon, how do we want to kick that off today? What do we want to talk about first? Well, I think we should also talk about like the definition and what we mean by queer, because there mm. are several opinions that believe that the character of Harry Potter itself could be interpreted as a gay character or a bi mm. character or someone who belongs under the LGBTQ umbrella. But what mm -hmm. we're saying most of all, is that queer is a label nowadays that has been taken by the LGBTQ community, kind of reinforced to make a more political statement, mm -hmm. uh, that it is a gathering and a unification of uh, pushing back on the norms of society, specifically relating to relationships, love, and uh, again, LGBTQ Themes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we mean by Harry Potter is queer is that there is a reason so many queer kids, adults, youth have really glommed on to this fandom and have glommed on to this story and identify so heavily with it. Yeah. Uh, that really has not only uplifted Harry Potter in general and made it the popular po popularity that it is today, but has also continued through this. Yeah. So uh, um, Zoomers, uh, if you're listening and you're like, why the fuck do millennials like that stupid Harry Potter anyway? It's not all that. Okay. There's a reason. There's a reason all of the queer millennials love Harry Potter. And I will say also, I want to acknowledge, I know a lot of you Zoomers don't like the word queer. You consider it a slur. We're going to use it. I'm going to tell you why very explicitly. You might not believe me. That's fine. I understand. Queer is not a slur. The mm -hmm. idea of the word queer being a slur was started by TERFs on Tumblr when you were too young to remember. That's just the truth. I was there. And 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 so, you know, just a little bit of trust me, bro energy. I know. But, but queer is not a slur. TERFs on Tumblr made that up and spread that crap around. Queer is a beautiful umbrella term. That's why when you go to college, for a lot of you that are, that are college age or a little bit older, you will know the classes are called queer studies. That's why, because it's an umbrella term for for gay people, and it has been for a really long time. So we're going to continue to say queer, because that is really, truly what we mean when we're talking about Harry Potter. It's not just about sexuality. It's also about alternative lifestyles. It's also about gender. Um, yeah. It's about all of those things. Yes. And then that is the important part, too, is that queer is not just LGBTQ focused. It is also covers the umbrella of non-monogamy. It covers the umbrella of gender uh, exploration and expression mm -hmm. uh, and also just kind of all things that differ from the norms of American society. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the opposite of saying um, hetero uh, cis. <laughs> hetero cis. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. And, and that's also what makes it so undefinable. But speaking as someone who identifies underneath the queer umbrella, I'm going to say whatever word I want. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Rar. It means that I don't. OK, so I just love this comment. So I want to read it out. Queer makes it so yeah. I don't have to say I am probably a romantic, asexual, non-binary who can't figure out how to present correctly. Because that's a lot of words. That's a lot of, and you know what? The, the what, here's why I love the word queer, and why I uh, I identify Harry Potter with queer so much is because I am somebody that really rejects a lot of labels. I don't like the idea of me being able to say I'm X Y Z, and then in your mind you uh, conjure all of these things that that means. Um, without getting to know me. I want people to do the work to get to know me. And I feel like queer doesn't tell you anything other than not cishet, you know? So that's why I really like it. And I also appreciate that so much of uh, discovering your sexuality and exploring within the realms of sexuality is that things change, mm. um, that the world changes. Um, mm. By myself, I mean, we've talked about this uh, theme before, but I'll just 
very briefly summarize my journey of being thinking I was straight as a kid coming through and realizing that I was bi did not like the term bi so I went to pan now I went to queen queer and then I went to lesbian and it's just easier a lot a lot for the cis, cis hetero people to just say queer because yeah. then if something in my identity changes or I date someone who's not traditionally what would be perceived as a woman, people are not confused by it because I mm -hmm. just sit there and I say, I date who I want to date. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it does make it a lot easier for people to understand. So they don't come back to you and say like, well, you're not a lesbian because of da, 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 you know, or whatever, whatever it is that they've decided the term means in their head, because nobody has a strict definition of what queer means. So no one's going to be able to be like, well, you're not queer because you do this and this and this and do that. Yes. Um, very, very easy. And and so I think it applies. It can, because the word is so umbrella and so, so uh, open, we can easily apply it to Harry Potter and, 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 and make mm -hmm. it match. <laughs> and make it match. So, yes. Uh, let's take the steps into the ways that Harry Potter is queer. Like mm -hmm, both. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, first and foremost, I guess we have to talk about the awkward queer baiting elephant in the room, Mr. Dumbledore himself. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> who is we can totally in, start in with Dumbledore. Opinion, I think it's just good to get it out there to sit there and say, we were talking about this before stream too. Dumbledore, mm. I think is the least queer thing about Harry Potter. <sighs> Dumbledore being gay is the least gay thing about Harry Potter. Oh my God. So, okay. So in the original conception of Harry Potter, right? Dumbledore is the wise sage character that can come in and dispense a truth when necessary to push Harry forward, right? That is, that is the purpose of his character. So when JK Rowling came out and said like, well, Dumbledore is gay. That's the whole like hint with Grindelwald thing that's in the the final book. You know, it's it's uh it's the those two were lovers. Like that's that's it. And we were like, and then this honestly, this was the moment that people started losing patience with uh with JK Rowling is the truth because the fandom was very well, split. It was it was like half the people were like, fuck yeah, oh my God, queer representation finally. She was just she just couldn't do it back in the 90s, but now she's gonna do it. And the other half of the fandom was like, so where? Where? Show me. Well, and like also the important context of this is that this was literally announced less than a month after the book had been published. Yeah. So like yeah. it was like part of the press tour of the seventh book publishing of being like, oh, and also I wrote a queer character. And it's like, bitch, I didn't read that in here. Where? I didn't read that. What? Where? And I Where? was I was very young at the time. Um, this came out in 2010, so I would have been. Uh, I think I was probably actually I think 2008, so I was in eighth grade when the la final Harry Potter book came out. So um, I was I was pretty young, and I will say that I was like, oh my gosh, a queer character in Harry Potter. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I love it so much. I was on that team, and then the more I re realized how like little representation there was, the the more angry I got. And then it was my true final straw. I like did a whole 180. I like started falling out of love, started like hating JKR. But then I was like, I can hold on to this nugget of knowing there is a canon queer character. That there is a canon queer character in Dumbledore. And we're getting a Fantastic Beasts movie. We're going to see Dumbledore. We're going to see Dumbledore and Grindelwald. We're going to see the love story. We're going to see the falling out. We're going to see all of that. And then I get one movie with no mention at all and then i get two mo movies with a half-assed they were brothers they were than brothers they oh were closer God. than brothers uh sort of bullshit queer bearding that like screamed to all the queer kids in the room of like oh yeah this is gay but plausible deniability of being like oh, we didn't write anything gay we're not like that oh no it was like the no homo it was so fucking... no homo it was, it was so, so no homo, no homo. <sighs> and then people got angry so in this final movie they have a half-assed scene between Mads Michelson and Jude Law basically being like I loved you and then that's it robbed two of the hottest old men in Hollywood and we don't even get to see them kiss. Disgusting. 
I can't believe yeah. it. And it's just like, okay, so I want to go to this comment um, that Rar is making about how the old mentor character doesn't need to have a sexuality. Exactly. He doesn't. Okay. So let me tell you of a franchise that's garbage, but actually did this well. Um, Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan doesn't need a sexuality. He doesn't need a sexuality. Okay. But did you watch the new Obi-Wan series? You don't have to. It's not very good. However, the only reason it exists is basically... <laughs> <laughs> to prop up the Obikins, okay? In this series, Obi-Wan is obsessed with Anakin. It is it is very heated. It is um <laughs> it is almost sexual. They don't go there, okay? I don't want to get your hopes up. They don't go there. But I know an Obikin wrote that. Okay, an Obikin wrote that. Um, you know, and if they if JK Rowling had just never been like Dumbledore's gay, by the way, we could have had this amazing Dumbledore and Grindelwald fandom. This amazing Dumbledore and Grindelwald fandom that she just like, you know, just chopped the head off of instantly by doing this bullshit press tour. It was not needed. We don't need to know Dumbledore's sexuality. Okay, who gives a fuck? You can just leave it to fandom. You could have just left it to fandom. There's also so many implications with the man who is Harry's largest abuser. Mm -hmm. And consistently abuses the children that he is a power of within the series, being the only canonically gay man. <sighs> Which is, of course, something that JKR mm. didn't realize at the time, mm. right? Because we have to remember in the context of this, JKR does believe that Dumbledore is the heroic good guy. He is worthy. He is the most good character that ever existed. He is the hero, the martyr the every person wants to be right he he mm. is the best wizard in the world so mm -hmm. that that inherent like it's not purposeful but it speaks a lot to her subconsciousness to decide mm. that this character the character that consistently and constantly manipulates children mm. is the person who is gay mm. and mm. holds power over them <laughs> throw the chill and bow to him <laughs> Okay, can we talk about Grindelwald specifically for a second? Because I have a thought. I have a yeah. thought. Okay. So, um, as far as, like, the overall idea that Grindelwald is your big bad of World War I and Voldemort is your big bad of World War II, this is a concept that existed for a long time in Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling doesn't plan. We know this. But she, but this element has been there for a long time as far as her her kind of background ideas of, of the world. Okay. Grindelwald is probably actually the gayest character. Yeah, he he in in Harry Potter. Okay, the gayest character in Harry Potter is the big bad. Okay, and then we get to Wizard Wizarding World War Two. Okay, with Voldemort, it's the big bad, and Voldemort is the character that most rejects his own identity that he was born with and tries to create a new identity. Who else does that? That is what trans people go through, rejecting the identity they were given at birth and creating a new identity for themselves. I cannot unsee this now that I have seen it, that JK Rowling's two main villains are what she thinks of gay people and what she thinks of trans people. And now you can see it too. And I'm sorry, but... I can't I, I can't unsee it and I and I didn't want to bring you this pain, but I have to. Because that's the truth. It's the subconscious of the writer existing in a story. Like was this an allegory that was on purpose? No. No, no, she didn't do it on purpose. She just is that bigoted. But she's telling on herself, and it really shows like how much she doesn't uh like how much she villainizes what is a huge part of the fandom in the world that she created. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, yeah, it's tragic. So when we say that Dumbledore is the least queer thing about Harry Potter, I, I just think that we need to understand that as this is where we're coming from. This is the yeah. opinion that this, this show has taken. Yeah. <laughs> And we're sticking by it. And and we're not happy about it. You know, we're not no. happy about it. I, 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 
I slightly disagree. I love I you know me. I and for those of you who might not in the in the chat, uh I love more character background for characters, the mm. better. I don't mind knowing the sexuality of Dumbledore. I don't, I, I like it. I think it adds depth. I think it adds character. I, I like that it adds thought. Mm. But when it's just thrown out there and then like also attached to tragedy, because again, this is a man who, okay, fell in love with a man who ended up being the worst like going against the war leading to the thousands of slaughters of thousands of muggles Mm -hmm. like so Dumbledore is in love with a man who is truly the definition of evil Mm -hmm. loses that love is consistently manipulated by him loses that love and then spends the rest of his life alone as like the tragic gay character manipulating children like that sucks so I don't mind knowing it's just like put thought into it make it Mm -hmm. a full-blooded idea Mm -hmm. show it in the character prior to the post book interviews Mm -hmm. and then when you continuously make more content involving that character have it be involved in the fucking story yeah (laughs) yeah like i don't i don't need the author to come out during their press tour and say dumbledore was gay what i need need is a line in the book saying Dumbledore's ex-boyfriend Grindelwald. That's what or ex-lover. That, or, yeah, or what ugh. whatever. Ex hex husband. I don't care. I don't care the specifics. It doesn't matter. But that way it is not disputed. It is not editorializing afterwards. It is simply in the text and cannot be ignored. Mm-hmm. It's not fake wokeism. Yeah. Because yeah. fake wokeism then adds to her plausible deniability of her not being a bigot when it's so clear that she is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know that as of right now, she doesn't have a lot of specific hateful statements towards um, other queer people except for trans people, right? But as we have said before, and I think we said this during our JK Rowling episode specifically, um, bigotries tend to go together. Once you are heavily bigoted against one group, it is very easy for you to be convinced and to start to feel bigoted towards more groups. It's kind of like, it's a, it's a thing that sort of festers and grows, right? And she has become so bigoted to trans people. There's no way she is not also homophobic. She just hasn't said anything publicly yet. I also think it's important to remember that we have other queer coded characters in Harry Potter yeah. that are so incredibly queer coded and like she is refusing the queerness of them while using queerness as an allegory for them too. Mm-hmm. So like that shows bigotry. So mm-hmm. just because she hasn't said she hates gay people doesn't mean she hasn't shown it in her writing. Mm-hmm. Example, the biggest example I can think of is Remus Lupin. Of course, I think Remus Lupin proves that J.K. Rowling has never actually had a close gay friend that talked about what it is like to be gay with her. No one has ever had that conversation with her because otherwise Remus Lupin wouldn't exist in his his current state. Um, So Remus Lupin as a character, um, she has been very explicit in this, has said that the way that the werewolfism happens in him is intended to be an AIDS allegory. So let's just remember what happens to Remus Lupin. Remus Lupin is taken by Fenrir Greyback while Fenrir is an adult and Remus is a child and is bitten, okay, by Fenrir Greyback. And so Remus Lupin has been a werewolf since he was a child, um, a.k.a. what that means is that if this is an AIDS allegory, Remus Lupin was abducted and sexually abused by Fenrir Greyback and got AIDS because of it, and then had to be a child living with AIDS that he got from an adult. And I just, I just want that to sink in for a moment. The heck. And and to further it, it not only ruined his health, because he is at a health risk of being a werewolf, but it then ostracized him in a place of society. So that he had to keep this thing a secret. There was a fear of if anyone found out that he had AIDS or was lycanthrope that he had got from abuse as a child, that he would not be able to attend school, that he would not be able to exist within wizarding society, that he would constantly and consistently be an outsider. So then Dumbledore comes in and says, well, guess what? We can hide your gayness and this thing that happened to you. And you can't let anybody know. 
Mm -hmm. So then there is a conspiracy of him having to keep this quiet, having to live in the closet, like literally live in the closet, not even tell his best friends. His best friends find out from contextual clues of growing up and just being close to him rather than him ever disclosing anything. He admits that in the book, that James, Lily, uh, Sirius, and Peter all found out due to the fact that they've put it together rather than him ever saying it to them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like a metaphor itself or an allegory itself for staying in the closet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was violently really? outed. He 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 yeah. hit it so well that he never had an experience that we know of of coming out. His only coming out sp- experiences were were violent. They were against his will. He did not consent to those. Sirius told Severus, or Sirius told Sirius Black told Severus Snape. Uh, that if you wanted to find out where all the marauders went at the end of the night to go down to the uh, go down the Whomping Willow and see. And that's how Severus Snape discovered that he was a werewolf. That's one outing. And then Severus Snape outed him to the entirety of the wizarding world as a revenge plot in the third book. Yeah. And so yep. from there on out, Remus, I mean, and prior to that, Remus couldn't keep a job because he didn't disclose his medical records and his medical and his like what is the metaphor for queerness, but his lycanthropy. But then pro- post that, he couldn't get employed because he was already outed. Mm, mm-hmm. Which is not just how AIDS worked, because obviously gay men and AIDS were tied in the 90s, but all, also queerness in er, being a gay man in London prior to the, to the AIDS ac- epidemic was. Mm-hmm. Because we have to remember that although it was never illegal to be gay, in the United States, it was illegal to be gay, that you could be punished for being gay in Britain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Remus has all of these experiences that are negative, And then J.K. Rowling has the gall to say that there is no homophobia or that type of bigotry in the wizarding world. So in the wizarding world, we're expected to believe that the only bigotry that exists is due to blood status. There is no racial bigotry. There is no sexuality bigotry. There is no gendered bigotry that doesn't exist. The only bigotry is your blood status. And yet she writes this metaphor for AIDS that puts our poor character that has it in the most horrible situation. You expect me to believe that this world does not have any other types of bigotry. It just doesn't make any sense. It has all the same bigotry that our world has. And then some, that's the only thing that makes any sense. And it really shows her hand on how the progression of Remus's story goes because mm-hmm. you have other side characters and other characters in Harry Potter that have tragedy but have a happy ending. Yes. Remus Lupin ends up having a kid that he will never know because the, he dies. Like, and while I love the story and I really do like the and appreciate the metaphor for what Teddy represents in the death of Remus and Tonks, he has a tragic life. He not only mm-hmm. has a tragic life, but he has a tragic ending. Nothing happy ever happens to Remus Lupin. Yeah. Ever. Yep. The only happiness that exists is in an epilogue. Mm-hmm. Yep. That he's not even that he's not even alive for. Yeah. Yeah. That his so, his child has to be happy. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It, it is beyond ridiculous. And then of course you have like the lycanthropy carrying out the lycanthropy metaphor. You also have it attached to Bill Weasley, which I believe is also another queer coded character, uh, more on the bi train. He's the cool one earring, long haired alternative sort of sibling dude. Uh, and then all of a sudden is like really is bit by a light is bit by a werewolf, mm-hmm. uh, not during a full moon and has to like, live in the fear of can getting this disease mm-hmm. so like again because this is an a like a direct aids allegory from jkr's mouth there is like a confirmation of queerness or surrounding bill yeah and it also ties um queerness to sexual assault in a mm-hmm. very explicit way there is no examples of characters who are like I am a werewolf and I'm super proud about that. And it's an important part of my identity. There's nobody that says 
I wasn't born a werewolf, but I want to be. There is nobody that is like that. The only character we have that's proud to be a werewolf and is interested in that is Fenrir Greyback. And Fenrir Greyback's whole shtick is that he likes kids. That's it. That's that's all of his character. He's a he's a villain, he's a one-note villain, and he's scary. And what's scary about him is that he has a penchant for kids. So let's just think about that for a moment. So the only character that is happy with their lycanthropy and thinks that's a good part of their life is the pedo. That's it. That's all we have. Bill's yeah. not happy that he's a werewolf. He accepts it, but he's not happy about it. He's not happy he was bitten. It's just a thing he has to live with. You know, the only character that we that we have is Teddy in the epilogue. That's it. And we don't really get to follow him very much because we only have him in the epilogue and then just in like a little bit of extra writing. Well, right. also, there's no ever confirmation that Teddy, get, like there is a fear that Teddy will inherit lycanthrope traits, but there's mm-hmm. no confirmation of it in no, our The fandom just thinks he does. So, <laughs> yeah, the fan, the fandom has written that he does. And the fandom has written um, him also being a queer character. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fascinating how we do it, too. Yep. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention the other, in my opinion, uh, very obviously queer coded character and that would be draco malfoy um you have a boy who is being raised underneath pressure who is described in a very feminine way uh often draco is referred to by his hair color or is referred to by his looks rather than like in relation to what harry is feeling uh which is a very female trait uh, and how you relate to female characters necessarily more than male characters in books uh, and uh, is put under pressure to live up to the expectations of his parents and cracks underneath that pressure uh, and not living up to the expectations in which his parents hold him to and is has a secret that he can't share with anybody. So there is like this idea that it co- it could not be a gay a queer metaphor, but I truly believe it is because or in a lot of the queer fandom really grasp onto this character because that experience of like not living up to the expectations of what your parents are and denying them uh, what your what they think of you. Uh, is a is a very uniquely queer experience. Yeah, I think there's a reason that a lot of uh, the queer fandom for Harry Potter, a lot of those people are very into Harry and Draco as a ship, very mm-hmm. into it. And I think what Landon just described is kind of why. Um, not that that Draco is explicitly gay coded or anything like that, but I just think that his struggle is very relatable especially to american queers who are often growing up in either um christian households or bigoted households of some sort or even if they are not explicitly bigoted or christian our our culture in general is so that tends to be you know what pressure is put upon you so i think that what draco goes through with like being put in these this pressured situation where he that he can't live up to is um is pretty much the same track that uh, a lot of queer kids in the U.S. go through, except instead of being, you know, pressured to go be a wizard Nazi, <laughs> they're being pressured to do things like, um, like go to church or or marry hetero and have kids and, you know, or things of that nature. I read Draco as a femme non-binary and most my most is a reread. Very interesting way to look at the character. Yes, I yeah. think that is a valid interpretation of his character. There's a lot about the way that Harry describes him that I think um, it, it can, I can see, I can see it, you know, I can see it. Uh, and he's also an incredibly popular character to, uh, and we'll talk about the transing of Harry Potter characters, like fandom taking characters to, and and gender swapping them or mm-hmm. giving them trans storylines and he is a very popular one mm-hmm. to go through that mm-hmm. uh as a male to female tra- as a female or trans i've seen woman, both i've seen both ways having always been a trans male mm-hmm. um, yeah 
being a trans so it, man it, that transitioned very early. Um, yeah. I, I, I like that version of Draco. I think that's great. I think that's great. I, it's a very common trend that I have seen, not only existing in the Drary fandom, but existing fandom wide for anyone who like really has a spot and relates to Draco Malfoy. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I think it's an interesting thing that we have this redemption possibility with two characters where like you were raised evil and then made poor choices and then ultimately made the choices that helped save the world uh Mm -hmm. that is both uh severus the snape storyline and draco malfoy storyline and jkr praises severus snape fans and severus snape's storylines while actively disliking draco malfoy fans and actively like dismissing anybody who sees redemption in draco malfoy um, and I think that there's an interesting dichotomy there because I do feel that whether she consciously knows it or not, the people that are supporting Draco Malfoy are young women who find him attra- who find him attractive, and also the queer community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and seeing that, and knowing that, and knowing that Draco Malfoy is heavily tied to that community. There's a reason why she dislikes the character that she wrote, even though it's the same exact storyline of another character she praises. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's a reason. There is um, a reason. <laughs> and then there's one more uh, Harry Potter kind of queer character that I want to talk about. But we're just is just going to be a brief mention because I think this is like this is the character that J.K. Rowling thinks she wrote a queer character, but she kind of didn't. Um, and that would be Tonks. Okay. So Tonks is a, um, a metamorph magus. She can change her features at will. This is like the perfect chance to really show how, for, for J.K. Rowling to have shown how she actually feels about trans people if she truly loves them. Um, and what we end up with is a character who basically she she kind of forces a little bit um lupin to become heterosexual and if she really wanted lupin like like let's take this in jk rowling's world okay cuz full disclosure i am both into remadora and uh wolfstar so not specific alliances there for me yep. and so when it comes to uh remus lupin's character if his lycanthropy is like an AIDS allegory and he's supposed to be a gay man or whatever. What that means is that Tonks comes in and bullies him into marrying her <laughs> and then they both die. So we never get to find out if that was really like a decision he he truly, you know, would have stick, stuck with for a long term if, if Tonks really would have liked him long term and things like that, right? Um, <laughs> and so... If J.K. Rowling is telling the truth that she always intended for Remus to be gay, then why the fuck is the last thing his character does is to marry Tonks and have a kid with her? If this if she really intended this, then why? Which is also something that he never said he wanted. He never at any indication did Remus Lupin. I understand that we're seeing the story from a kid's perspective about an adult and Harry is oblivious to all things. Yes. But there is nothing consistent in third book Remus Lupin wanting a family and wanting a kid and wanting to get married. There's nothing about it. Yeah. He has had no desire to do so. I mean, and it, and it just goes to show how much that she troped Remus Lupin that she really was like oh we're just going to write this character as an allegory and not give him any meat beyond that Mm -hmm. because it feels so dysregulating when in the Mm -hmm. sixth book it is revealed that he's been in a romantic relationship with a woman who has been written queer uh, who in my opinion is the ultimate definition of a Mm -hmm. non-binary character Mm -hmm. uh, and is all of a sudden in a heteronormative straight relationship with a kid on the way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because this is the thing is it, when you because we just recently reread the last book okay and you know what bill and fleur's relationship feels way more queer to me than remus and Tom's it is. does and just the way that it's written and so like you what that basically means is jk rowling is saying hey gay people you can be straight too and and happy and die happy and i just i 
I don't like that as much as I, I love Rima Dora and I love Tonks and she's one of my all time favorite characters in the books. If you look at it from the perspective of Remus's character arc, what J.K. Rowling is saying about gay people is not good. It's not good. No, it's not, not good. Oh, well, thank you so much for the lurk blue. We uh, we love our lurkers here, but it's OK if you if you if we say something you want to type while you're lurking, that's OK, too. That's okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, from your homework. Oh, OK. I see that. Yeah. So um, so when it comes to Harry Potter, those are the main characters that we see that are kind of like they have something in canon that is very explicitly queer. I also will say I do want to throw Luna Lovegood in that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Uh, Luna Lovegood, I feel, is written as a very queer character. But the purpose of her is to feel abnormal and weird yeah. and ostracized. So, like, yeah. that's also a thing to just, like, throw in there to sit there and be like, okay, the other incredibly queer character is the is the outsider. Yeah, but like every character in Harry Potter that we that we know anything about is like been put upon by society in some way and all of those yes. characters you can add a queer lens to because queer people are so marginalized in our society. So, yes, you know, true. I think I I mean, I don't I don't get any queer vibes from Luna personally. Oh. I I think I get more like neurodivergent type of vibes um I things get- like that. I get neurodivergent kind of vibes from her too, but you know what? The Luna Jenny friendships screams let like screams oh lesbians. yeah oh yeah like, yeah that yeah. is like so I'm here for I, that. maybe maybe so maybe it's not luna maybe it's the combination of you know neurodivergent creative girlfriend with the sports jock girlfriend like yeah that yeah, is yeah, yeah, such yeah. A trope. <laughs> and, I, and that kind of leads us into what we were going to talk about like the relationships that are queer coded mm-hmm. um there are specific relationships that like stand out as queer relationships purposeful obviously Grindelwald and Dumbledore being one of them Mm. and not purposeful as well Wolfstar being one um which is an incredibly popular ship (laughs) sometimes it's hard to talk about these ships because uh (laughs) there's such high emotions attached to the fandom with them um yeah if if you were there you know (laughs) yeah Like Vietnam flashbacks. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I feel so bad for people that were hardcore Wolf Star because there was no reason while the books were coming out and while the movies were coming out for for us to think that they weren't right. You know, that Wolf Star fans yeah. weren't 100% right. And that Remus really was going to in the end be like, you know, this this whole thing, I was I was gay the whole time and I'm I'm gonna die with a husband or whatever, right? And obviously that's not what happens, he gets with Tonks. But there was no reason for any of us to think based on everything JK Rowling had said um about the AIDS allegory, based on everything that we had read in the books about Remus and about Sirius, that Wolfstar, when they were kids, was not real. Like mm-hmm. people really believed that in the the sixth and seventh books that we were gonna get some kind of flashback that proved Wolfstar was real. And there was no reason to doubt it at the time. There really wasn't. So I I understand. I understand how the the hardcore Wolfstar fans feel. And um and uh and and I think that we throw around the word queer baited quite a lot but there's a there's a couple of relationships in the harry potter fandom that like no i think these are legit queer baits and i think dumbledore and grindelwald is one of them and wolfstar is the other i think those fans were legit queer baited for real yeah because i there there really isn't a moment um until jkr put remus lupin in a straight relationship Mm -hmm. and uh oh, Landon's frozen again. Um, yes, I think so for sure. When it comes to these these relationships, that um, you know you're built up over time based on what's been said in interviews and what's been said in canon. Uh, that uh, that there's going to be a queer reveal. There's going to be a queer reveal. There's going to be a queer reveal. It's not like I think about like other um, things that people accuse of of queer baiting. And, uh, and it's not the same. Okay. It's not the same. Like I'll think of a really recent example that is just straight up, not queer baiting. There was, um, <laughs> what's this free spell in Harry Potter? It's her internet. She's going to come back and be like, fuck spectrum. Um, but in, uh, in, in Harry Potter, you know, it, it's, it's real, it's real queer baiting. It's not like, oh, now we've got two Karens. That's just, that's cool. That's cool. She'll be back in a second. Let me just hide her camera. 
There we go. She'll be back in a second. So, uh, so we think of, for example, people insisting that uh, that queer actors play queer characters, which is great. But what that turns into is queer actors being forced to out themselves and say, like, you know, I am gay, actually. Um, and uh, and and that's not cool. And that's not queer baiting, by the way. Like, we've got to stop doing that. We've got to stop asking for actors to do that. Landon, welcome back, friend. Can you talk? We, we can't hear you, though. Zoom can't hear you. Oh, I know. I go. put my I was cussing up a storm and I was like, if they start hearing me while I'm cussing up a storm and I'm still frozen, I don't want that. So I put it out <laughs> of you. But, well, you're back. You're back. OK, so uh, what were you saying? We literally only heard the first few words and then you froze. Oh, so fun. Let's see if I can get this uh, straight this thought process back. Yeah, there was no there was no proof in any of the books. Uh, that J.K. Rowell or that Sirius Black and Remus R- Lupin weren't in a romantic relationship when they were little or when they were younger until Remus th- was thrown in a relationship of a of a straight relationship. Mm-hmm. And I genuinely do believe that that was a choice made as a deniability mm-hmm. for Wolfstar. Yeah. Because Wolfstar got big really quickly. Yeah. And there is no... <laughs> There is no way that you can write, especially with a dead character at that point, a story uh, and sit there and be like, oh, yeah, Reba, Sirius and I were the best of friends and only platonic and never fucked at all. Uh, And uh, you can't do that. (laughs) You can't. can't. (laughs) But what you can do is marry the man off and have him have a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know and- that J.K. Rowling does this. She she writes things to basically be like, stop saying this is the way it is. I'm going to go write the opposite. Like literally, Fantastic yeah. Beasts exists because people kept going, J.K. Rowling, why didn't the wizards stop World War real World War II? Like, and so she's like, okay, fine, here we go. Here's why they didn't stop it. Um, like and she and she's done this multiple times. And and I I agree. I think Remadora exists. Because J.K. Rowling was annoyed with um with the Wolf Stars, I think that's true. That's true. <laughs> um. So so yeah, she does this quite a lot. She does this quite a lot. Um. Yeah. Unfortunately, Landon, is it unfortunate? I don't know. James and, James and Snape. Yeah, it's a fine ship. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not popular. It's not popular. It's dreary. Just when they're It's not it's not dreary. Oh my god. I could have a I could just it's it's not dreary Y'all, it's not it's not easy to trigger Landon, but there are certain things and I just know and then I just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start crying. <clears throat> it's fine. I'm fine <laughs> people are just <laughs> bullying me uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, okay anyway <laughs> anyway yeah I, I agree i think rima dora um partially exists to say fuck you to wolf stars i don't i don't think that that's oh, incorrect yeah. no i think that that was the total the total reason it was because she did string it along she did and, and i don't think she meant to write it queer like i think that it's like one of those things where uh it wasn't purposely queer baited Mm -hmm. it just was heightened Mm -hmm. until it grew too big and then Mm -hmm. she wanted to shut down the gaze Mm -hmm. and so she figured out how to do that uh Mm -hmm. because uh again we know that she feels incredibly protective over her characters she does like in interviews in how she reacted with severus snape in what she's written and how she's written characters we know that she doesn't like when characters are interpreted outside of her thought process and yeah. her things. So yeah. as soon as we started going down a road that she disagreed with, with, which is Sirius and Remus are in love and always have been and are reunited. Uh, and now Remus has lost the love of his life again. She didn't like that. So she had to throw a wrench in that because that's mm-hmm. not her character. 
Yeah. Rar, I think as far as asking if J.K. Rowling is anti-fandom or or pro-fandom, it's complicated. On one hand, she she doesn't like people touching her things, but on the other hand, I think she saw what happened to the um the Anne Rice and the the Vampire Chronicles fandom and in the cuz Anne Rice went through and like actually tried to take down fanfics and things like that. And J.K. Rowling knew that that was not a winning strategy. So, I think she is she is pro and anti fandom uh, when it suits her. I don't think she actually has like a moral framework stance on it. I think she she picks and chooses being pro or anti as it suits whatever her her goal is. Um, so it's complicated. It's complicated. I think, I think fandom also she recognizes that fandom gave her her power. Yeah, right. Like in a way that Anne Rice never did because Anne yeah. Rice came into the world wanting to be a writer before internet fandom existed yeah fandom was a very different Uh, thing when when she was first getting popular and it kind of like came out it came out like underneath her yes um whereas jkr i think really does has not only a had probably doesn't end as much anymore but had access to the fandom that was direct and right there she almost had a like hand on the pulse of it mm-hmm. yeah from and go she knew yeah from go and she knew this was the thing and this was the people that mm-hmm. that skyrocketed her out of poverty yeah. and then also gave her a platform and yeah. also gave her a voice yeah um now not so much uh, because most of her fandom doesn't listen to her. It's the turfs that have now taken over that. Yeah. Because like, remember when, when J.K. Rowling started, she was like, she was destitute and struggling and, you know, wanted to be a writer so desperately. So it's just, you know, it's different. She she has she has no moral framework to be pro or anti-fan. She's just, she yeah. she does whatever action suits the goal that she has at that time. I also think marketing had marketing and a publisher that was younger and newer and uh, a little bit more upbeat as Penguin as Penguin and uh, I think it was Schuster uh, was um, I think really also led to her relationship with fandom as well because. Mm-hmm. Remember, she has a giant publisher behind her. They saw all that happened with Anne Rice and knew that they couldn't repeat that. Mm -hmm. So even if JKR didn't like her fandom, she was never allowed to say that until she started arguing with people. But even now, even now she doesn't say she doesn't like her fandom. She just pretends that the TERFs are her fandom and the rest of us are not. Yes, and she and she actively separates from aspects of the fandom that she doesn't like. Or again, writes canonically to dis like to dismiss mm-hmm. what she doesn't like mm-hmm. um so yeah i think that <sighs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yes um so we are we are getting uh, we are yeah. getting close to to 1 p.m and i think this is a good break considering the topics that we wanted to talk about today so why yes. don't we go ahead and do our our audible ad break <gasps> what well, we don't know- we if you don't know, I have a real book in my hand. Who knew? What? Um, if you don't know what Audible is, Audible is an online and app uh, audiobook store. I that is through Amazon that you can listen to some of your favorite books read by professional audio uh, readers. So if you want to go to audibletrial.com slash enter stage window, you get a month free and an audiobook. Mm-hmm. And I have a recommendation for you, which is Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Uh, we're going to start this next section by talking about the importance of uh, Harry Potter in queer literature. And this is a beautiful example of one of them. Uh, this is the story of Simon and I believe it's Baz. I couldn't remember if it was Kaz or Baz. Uh, Simon and Baz who attend a wizarding school and were roommates and hated each other. And then it turned gay. Uh, and so it is the adventures and stories of their love story and defeating the evil wizard, uh, the mage, who is possibly threatening the world with mass destruction. And for some reason, it sounds very similar to Harry Potter because it is. It's fan fiction. This is fan fiction. It's dreary uh, fan fiction, you guys. It's dreary fan fiction. <laughs> who wouldn't love it? Yes. Um. So, yes. 
So audibletrial.com slash interstage window. If you go there and sign up for your free 30 days, you help support the show and we would really appreciate it. And this is a service that I do personally use and support. Um, I don't got time to read words, so I I listen to them. Um, So I actually do use Audible quite a bit for my actual reading and uh, and I highly recommend it. So if you're interested, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. And it's an important weekly reminder to remind you that listening to an audiobook is the same thing as reading a book. You are still reading. Uh, mm-hmm. The people who sit there and say that I don't really read books, I just listen to Audible. That is the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. You're still engaging with prose, which is at the end of the day, what's important when it comes to reading. So if you want a way to uh, multitask and also read, Audible is a great way to do that. That's right. Yes. So, so what about it? So Landon, you, you know, quite a lot about this uh, because you, you, you read, you read quite a lot of, um, of this type of genre Mm -hmm. and Harry Potter just comes up over and over and over. What's up with that when it comes to queer literature? It just awkwardly exists in, uh, and by awkwardly, I mean, wonderfully exists in both contemporary and speculative fiction. Uh, so you have you have two main genres that exist, uh, which is contemporary. It is what happens in modern day. It is what our world is very based off of. No magic, anything like that. And it takes place within the last 10 years and, and into the future of the next five. Uh, so it's modern day storytelling and then you have speculative which is your sci-fi and fantasy romances uh and the direct references that exist in so much of ya and new adult queer literature about harry potter is uh insane uh one of the most famous examples which has actually recently been taken out as a reference and a reaction to uh turf statements by jk rowling uh is in the book red white and royal blue which is currently being made into a movie uh where the two characters are modern day uh characters who both love harry potter and talk about the queerness of the characters within harry potter and relate to the characters within harry potter uh you have several other books that do very similarly um it's very popular kind of go to uh, reference in a lot of stories that are contemporary. And while that's important to know because Harry Potter is such a universal book series that a lot of people can relate to, the fact that it shows up as consistently as it does within queer literature is amazing. Uh, And that is because it is an essential part of queer stories mm-hmm. and relating to queer characters. Uh, and it's it's just that interesting thing. And then, of course, you have books like Carry On. You have uh, books like Sarah J. Moss. You have other stories that are really based off of Harry Potter itself and tropes that exist and are based dire- directly off of Uh, Harry Potter that are also queer related Mm -hmm. Um, and it just is it just shows where these queer stories stem from and where their seed was planted is Harry Potter which is part of what makes Harry Potter queer yeah because there is inspiration taken from the source and it's very common nowadays to get something published where you wrote a fanfic and then kind of like scrubbed the serial numbers off as it will and then published it as like um, a changed version of that fanfic that is very common Mm -hmm. and lots of these are based on on harry potter because harry potter is one of the largest fandom fanfic producing fandoms and and i Mm -hmm. think that this is this is very obvious when you think about even harry himself from the beginning, because what happens in Harry Potter is that Harry learns that he's not like other kids. He's a wizard, actually. And so he comes out of the closet. Quite literally, he lives in the closet under the stairs in the first book, and he comes out of the closet. And it should be no surprise, then, why kids that feel put upon in life are going to connect with him. And almost all queer kids feel this way, feel strange in some way. So 
Of course, Harry Potter has a huge queer fanfic base, more so than even everything else, because of course, a lot of fanfic is queer. Um, it's a misconception that majority of it is queer. That's not really true. But it's not. It's not. <laughs> if you look at the statistics, majority of, of fan fiction is hetero. But Harry Potter has quite a lot of queer stuff. And it's it's because the seeds of the type of thing that a queer kid would connect with exist in the mm-hmm. first book. Yep. Well, and not just the first book, but also the relationships and dynamics that are built within it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a relatable story like yeah. that is an incredibly important part of it but that you also have so many other queer characters that are relatable into it because not everyone's going to relate to harry potter but if they don't relate to harry potter they might relate to draco malfoy or they might relate to ronald weasley and obviously not all of these characters are queer coded but because it is a queer loving story and a place that that people who who do view themselves as LGBTQ gather and stem from, being able to have those references are almost a code in itself. Mm-hmm. Like you read, I, I I got a list. I made a list. I forgot to pull it up. So you read, uh, they both are dying. They both die in the end. The last night of the Telegraph Club. Uh, Love Simon. Um, Simon versus the Homo Sapien Agendas. All of these books have direct Harry Potter references in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, naming Harry Potter. Like, not mm-hmm. just like, oh, boy, wizard. I'm talking like straight up Harry Potter reference. And that is a flag to not only the reader, but also other people who consider themselves under the LGBTQ fandom to sit mm-hmm. there and be like, hey, I see you too. I was in the same boat we exist here together. Mm -hmm, So it is like, mm -hmm. it's become its own coded language. Harry Potter has now inserted itself into the queer code community. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is largely because the fandom um, was always friendly to queer people. Like it was, it was one of those fandoms that um, you got ostracized. If you said something bigoted against queer people, not the other way around, which is not necessarily true of other large fandoms. Like I think about other large fandoms that existed at the time. And the one that springs to mind the most is Disney fandom. Okay. Yeah. And I would say Disney fandoms, the opposite, like you are not allowed to talk about that type of stuff on the Disney forums in the early two thousands, because they were very conservative. You were told things like, shut up. We don't want to hear about that. Let's good vibes only, you know, type of stuff. And we didn't talk, we didn't talk like, we didn't say good vibes only in 2004. Okay. But you get what I'm saying. Um, (laughs) But uh, but that's not true in the Harry Potter fandom. In the Harry Potter fandom, my experience was largely the opposite, where when people came in and said vaguely bigoted things, everyone was like, shut up. You know, it was the other way around. Uh, instead of when people came in and wanted to talk about progressive things, they were told to shut up. Um, so the Harry Potter fandom, regardless of what's in the source material, regardless of uh, of J.K. Rowling herself, has been queer since the beginning. Yes, it has. Yep. So there's no wonder that there's so much queer contemporary literature that directly references Harry Potter, because I'm sure they grew up and had the exact same experiences largely that that we had. Yeah. And and just knowing that those are two different like things that the speculative fiction where it's all the fantasy and stuff like that comes from the Harry Potter fan fiction realm. And then the contemporary is flagging for other fans and other people who exist within that world. Mm-hmm. And um it is interesting, like, because I know that we talked about, like, Gen Z or Zoomers being, like, really tired of us talking about queer and also tired of people talking about labels. But there's also, like, this level of them also being tired of us talking about Harry Potter. And <laughs> it's a Venn diagram. There is a Venn diagram <laughs> happening uh, because guess what? <laughs> mm-hmm. A lot of the people who are talking about Harry Potter still are queer and that that is a flag of safety that is a flag of the communities and a way that uh we talk to each other because in 2004 Mm -hmm. it was a kind space but also because it is so ingrained in our safety Mm -hmm. and in our growing up 
that it's it's an interesting Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah. And I think it is changing because of because of JK Rowling and a lot of people are like, well, I want to distance myself from Harry Potter now. And um and and I have a lot of feelings from that. We're gonna we're gonna have an episode talking about the state of the Harry Potter fandom in December where we can go into that. But um but for years and years and years, um it really is until very recently that uh that it was. And there's a lot of people still clinging to that. And I can hundred percent understand why and uh and you know why they they feel like they still want to hold that flag because it's so much easier to hold the flag of saying i'm harry i'm a harry potter fan than to hold the flag of saying i'm gay and it's also very an interesting um dynamic because it's there's a lot of people who are also reclaiming harry potter away from jk rowling and again Mm -hmm. we're gonna go more into this uh during our state of the union or state of harry potter union sort of like wrap up but wanting to talk about like how people are reclaiming it how specifically queer people are still interacting in a world that feels safe within a fandom that feels safe in a fandom that they grew from that they do identify as queer within while not engaging or trying to engage as little as possible with someone who is so whose views are so drastically anti them yeah anti their existence yeah uh and so you have things like the transing of harry potter characters yeah, that's uh, the main is, main thing that i see is like people absolutely. that are that are not interested in letting go of harry potter but are also um not interested in uh in entertaining that jk rowling has anything useful to say in regards to this are just basically taking harry potter and transing it um which is great i love this yeah, and it's basically it's taking Harry Potter characters, whether it be in fiction or whether it be again revamping it and producing it into something else, um, or talking about it in queer literature mm-hmm. and critiquing it in queer literature or turning it. So, like in Red, White, Royal, Blue, uh, talking about how Draco and Harry were gay for each other, mm-hmm. like obviously something that didn't happen canonically, but something that is a very large part of the queer Harry Potter fan base, mm-hmm. and then now exists within another fan base of itself. Mm-hmm. So, like taking those small things and reclaiming it in the framing of queerness mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. incredibly, incredibly fun (laughs) and (laughs) and really part of like that we don't care about jkr she can Mm -hmm. be abhorrent and yes she has money and yes that is still causing harm but we can take characters and make them trans in fan fiction we can do it in our art and we can do it in publishable works that reference actively reference these books that are supposed to have hate towards us Mm -hmm. It is blue. It is just um, standard fandom stuff. But I've seen an absolute explosion in, uh, I guess you could say trans. I use it as a, I'm using it as a verb here. Um, but transing Harry Potter characters in fan fiction and fan art, I really, I really didn't see a lot of that. To be honest, like when it came to Harry Potter, the only time I really saw anyone doing anything trans with Harry Potter was about Tonks. That was it. Um, I never, I never really saw a lot of it, but. In the past few years, I've seen a lot of trans Draco, especially. Yes. <laughs> and I just never used to really see that. Um, it would always, it, before it was like a very niche thing, very rare. And now it's kind of like, it pops up qu- f- quite frequently. <laughs> yeah, the tag in AO3 has grown exponentially um, mm-hmm. as far as like fan fiction goes. And yes, it is obviously a very like fandom thing to do that especially like when people relate heavily to a character and then want that character relate even more to them that is something that exists but in the recent like probably three or four years it has been there's been an explosion towards that Mm -hmm. and there's been conversations about it Mm -hmm. um and is it everything no but it is an interesting realization that we are making that this is existing within the fandom. And I do think it has a direct response. And I know it's a direct response because Mm -hmm. I know that there are strong people within the fandom who organize specifically, see JK Rowling post something and then post something gay or queer as a, as a like reflection or as a response to what she's saying. Mm -hmm. I have artists who have done that with, uh, with queer and trans characters. And I know for sure 
of fiction and stories that exist on AO3 that have done that as a like response. Mm -hmm. And because we have someone who is so actively anti-trans, having a fandom that is willing to respond in that way, I think is uniquely Harry Potter. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. At least um, the fan it's it's the only fandom I can the only like large, massive fandom I can yes. think of that is doing these sorts of things. There are plenty of fandoms that have like tons of um, trans fans and tons of fans that uh, headcanon the characters as trans and things like that. Um, Our flag means death in particular comes to mind. That's mm-hmm. the recent like little pirate show. And there's a I, I see a whole whole lot of like this character's trans that character's trans whatever in the in that fandom um but that like that's tiny <laughs> that fandom is itty bitty um harry potter is massive well, and also i don't believe their creator spoke negatively against it no like that's no. the thing that it, that's the reclaiming part of it is yes. that like it truly has been a we are going to turn on our we're going to turn on the creator of this thing and say, I don't fucking care what you believe yeah. as an active response to your hurtful and harmful beliefs and tweets. I am going to take the thing you created and turn it back on you and gain profit from it, whether it be social profit where people's art is being recognized or actual value profit because people are mm-hmm. buying things or donating to Patreons or anything like that. I think that that is an incredibly like, cool thing and it does feel uniquely harry potter on this large of an aspect because of again that venn diagram of you got us at the right age you got the right people the queer kids have stuck with you and now we are turning the thing that you are trying to take from us and we are not letting you do it yeah yeah exactly yeah taika watiti doesn't um he doesn't have anything negative to say he doesn't yes. need to have anything to say about queer people. Yeah, people take yeah the Absolutely. that book that we just recommended. That's dreary fanfic that someone turned yeah. into a real book. It started out as this dreary is, fanfic. So it it started out. It's a, actually it's a really cool story. Rainbow Rowell was a huge Harry Potter fan. She wrote a best selling novel called Fangirl, and the story is about a young girl who's going through her first year of college. It's a fantastic book, one of my favorites. I actually need to reread it this year. Um. Uh, who's going through college and she writes Harry Potter, quote unquote. It's, 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 uh, it's something, there's like a seven book series. I can't remember. It's Simon something. uh, And it's a seven book series in this book that has a worst enemy turned lover, like enemies to lover person. It is clearly Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter. Uh, And the author has all but like directly confirmed it because she doesn't want to be sued. (laughs) Uh, and in the story, there are vignettes of this story. And as a response, she published the full dreary fan fiction that is written in the world of her other novel. And that is directly inspired off of her experience of writing fan fiction, her invalidation that she got from college professors, basically saying like fan fiction isn't an actual form of expression of writing. And then taking a queer story and making sure that it was written because fans who felt the queerness in Harry Potter latched onto it so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you've not looked into it before, you'd be amazed at how many books um, end up popular uh, pieces of fiction that were originally fanfic. Mm-hmm. It's quite a lot. It's then, quite a lot. It's very common for people to do that nowadays. Yeah. And also popular fan fiction artists will 100% have Patreons in which that people can uh, support them for their art. Uh, They can sell prints because there is nothing directly stolen from J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. It is a description of a character. And in these cases, remember, because we're talking about LGBTQ characters or trans characters, Oh, no, Frozen again. Anyway, what I think she was going to say was that because we're taking these characters and making them trans or or, or gay, then um, it's definitely not directly from those characters. You're back. Welcome back, Landon. Bye. Thank you. Hi. Yes. No, exactly I think I finished you your sentence. Saying. I think I finished. Exactly your... what you okay. were saying. I was saying. <laughs> um, so, so, no, I don't think uh, it is at all sketch in, in the words that you used because it's inspired off of all of this and a hundred percent 
should also support i mean that kind of goes into our next part of supporting <laughs> queer ca- queer people thank you <laughs> supporting to- spectrum stop casting petrificus totalis on her my gosh <laughs> someone yes. take away the wand um <laughs> no but supporting queer characters um and queer people mm-hmm. uh who are who are doing this queer fighting, putting the money back in their hands yeah. so if there are i mean it's and we say the same thing also um about creators of color too mm-hmm. um if there are creators of color or artists of color who are also within the phantom because especially there's been a lot of anti-blackism in in harry potter as well um oh gosh yeah <laughs> it's a great way to support the people who are making creations based off of a thing without actually directly stealing anything from mm-hmm. the person yeah, there's quite a already lot. a gazillionaire <laughs> there's quite a lot of people that um that are happy to still purchase fan-made content for harry potter even though they have vowed to not spend any more money on canon harry potter content mm-hmm. right? i do that profiting off of someone else or blue everyone does no one's ever had a unique idea ever so i mean that's a whole other episode though um but i got some content on my channel actually about that if you're curious on our opinions about that <laughs> yeah but i mean i think it's an important thing to talk yeah, yeah, yeah. About is, is that i mean that's part of fandom and mm-hmm. and i'm not and i'm and fan fiction is different fan fiction is stories like there aren't places that you can support like ao3 in general it, it is illegal to support and pay for fan fiction Mm -hmm. fan art is a separate thing anything that is not trademark is public yeah ability to have yes you can't like take a comic book page and trace it and sell that but you can create your own art of a comic book character and sell that Yes. So, so there's a famous, like, actually, people are getting in trouble with this. It's a whole thing. But there is a famous um, Wolf Star fiction called All the Young Boys, uh, which is being marketed and sold in a hardcover copy, and is receiving trouble for it because it is a direct violation of mm-hmm. theft. That they is didn't theft. they didn't file the serial numbers off good enough, unfortunately. In yes, that case, they did not. <laughs> However, if they came back with all the young dudes, it's all the young dudes. Sorry, and uh, changed the names and changed the locations, mm-hmm. then they could sell it, but it would still be derivative of Harry Potter. Yeah, and we would um, still know because, of course, I'm sure it would be something that was published. But yeah, and there's there's quite a lot of this. There's quite a lot of this um, kind of uh, fandom as activism. So I just I just want to be clear um, when when you tweet something, it's not really activism in the in the direct action sense. However, um, that doesn't mean that there's not there's not elements of activism in like art that you create and things like that. Okay. So we talk a lot about JK Rowling's tweets. But the thing that really makes me mad is not JK Rowling's tweets. It's the money that she pours into the ideas behind her tweets. Uh, Because she gives to those politicians that are anti-LGBT as well as tweeting the horrendous things that she tweets. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of pushback from fandom to create queer art explicitly as a counter protest to to those things that JK Rowling has tweeted. And that's quite popular in the Harry Potter fandom, especially. And I will forever, I will forever support uh, artists who are fighting uh, any sort of uh, phobia, whether mm-hmm. it be transphobia, racism, anything mm-hmm. like that, as an active uh, return protest, it is a valuable way of doing it. Yeah. And because we can't death of the author, since J.K. Rowling is alive and actively harming people, this is an amazing way of protesting and showing activism. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, there's other ways of showing activism too, as far as donations, there's, uh, several nonprofit organizations, the Trevor Project for one has Harry Potter themed events in which it it really does advertise towards Harry Potter fans to raise money for trans youth. Uh, The Harry Potter Alliance is also an incredible resource that Mm -hmm. is trans-inclusive, anti-JK Rowling, that uses Harry Potter as a way to market itself to support reading in schools, uh, access to warm food and shelter for uh, trans and queer people, as well as uh, really just 
um, helping with reading literacy all over the country mm -hmm. uh, in poverty and uh, especially those in, in areas that have high poverty percentages. Mm -hmm. Like there are a lot of ways that uh, activ activism and support of LGBTQ rights has been inspired off of Harry Potter. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. And um, and I think that uh, that all of these things are, are a good push towards towards like uh, the world that we want to see. Right. And and if history is any guide, then the turfs are going to lose in the end. So, you know what? You might as well get on the winning side, too. <laughs> <laughs> Death of the offer. I think we should take notes from Kingdom Hearts 2 or and perhaps blue, perhaps. That's a very niche joke, my friend. <laughs> But I like it. Okay. So yeah, I just I I am continually inspired I, by the Harry joke, Potter that's fandom. A Kingdom Hearts joke. Sorry, I just I just read the joke and I got it. It's very rare. <gasps> but have I you play, do you know very... do you know Orin's backstory in Final Fantasy X though? You have to know that a little bit. I don't think I think that's the part oh. that you're missing. Okay. Never yeah. Mind. That's okay. <laughs> It's okay. You did get part of the joke. <laughs> I got I got the hideous part of the joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um Well, I forgot what I was saying. Sorry, sorry. I oh, didn't mean no. to interrupt you. I just got really excited about it. It's okay. It's okay. Someday we're going to have to play Kingdom Hearts, okay? Since that's like the one game Landon really knows. We're going to have to like play Kingdom Hearts and like analyze it as we play or something like that. I don't know. That would be fun. <laughs> Good be. <laughs> um yes so so i am continually inspired by uh the activism that exists in the harry potter fandom as much as going through all the harry potter books and picking them apart and everything as an adult has changed a little bit about how i personally feel about harry potter um i still regardless of that i still feel very inspired by all the different things that the harry potter fandom does uh the harry potter fandom is 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 strong is strong and and i still feel very safe in the fandom uh i don't wander into a harry potter fandom space and find turfs or if i find them everyone's all, already bitching at them so that's it's nice it's still nice it feels still like a safe space even though harry potter itself is no longer safe yeah, it, it is interesting that a fandom that is surrounded by someone who's so anti-queer mm -hmm. is so queer affirming. Mm -hmm. And I don't know at this point in time, a true Harry Potter fan, um, like someone who actively engages in fandom mm. that still supports J.K. Rowling. Yeah, me either. I mean, the general vibe of the fandom that I get is anywhere in the gamut of we would like to ignore J.K. Rowling. Um, she's awful and, and we just don't want to even acknowledge her all the way into constantly actively bitching about J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see anything outside of the that spectrum, right? That's pretty much what I see <laughs> in the Harry Potter yeah. fandom. Yep. And it's it, it it's part of like building a community like that mm -hmm. is something that I do truly love about Harry Potter still mm -hmm. is the fandom can gather together and can even as much rift and rife and ugliness as there has been yeah. in the last 20 years of this fandom um we can really truly take this particular issue and agree on it yeah yeah we can yeah we can Okay, Landon, I want to I want to talk about the last thing. Are we ready? Mm, let's talk about it. Okay. All right. So I also just want to say that my favorite anti Harry Potter piece of literature that I have seen come out um, in the recent years is uh, is called Harriet Porter Potter or Harriet Porter. I think is the title. Porter by uh, Chuck Porber. Porber. Yes, by Chuck. Tingle. Okay. If you have not experienced this book, Koneko, you've returned to where we're talking about Chuck Tingle. Okay. If you have not experienced this book, I highly recommend it. It is, it is actually good. Okay. It is actually good. Um, it doesn't have as much to do with Harry Potter as you would think. Uh, it features a trans version of Harry Potter, sort of, although the character really doesn't have a lot to do with Harry Potter other than they are magical. And um, and they they enter into a relationship with this book's version of Severus Snape. Okay. 
and they are trans and they have they have a lot of trans sex but their relationship is actually very charming okay and you root for them and you really like agree with them getting together in the end it's fantastic if you would like to hear um a, a actual like really good breakdown of this book uh, Strange Aeons has a video on it that encapsulates very well uh, all of the things that I thought were good about this book. But if you don't want that, I do recommend actually picking it up. I don't know anything about Chuck Tingle other than he is a, other than him as a meme. Okay, so let's be clear: this is the only Chuck Tingle book I have ever ever read. Okay, this is the only one. And, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't know much about the Chuck Tingle verse, but the way that he wrote these characters, I I was like in for it. I was in for the ride and, and I was there and there's so many funny jokes and digs at JK Rowling that I was just amused throughout. So, um, if you are not that into reading these sorts of like Harry Potter, uh, gay protest ish fix yet, or you've not experienced it before, this is a great first one to experience. It's Chuck Tingle's book. I highly recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I will be honest. I have not read it. It's it so good. Me. It scares it's so me a good. little. Mostly because I'm so... I know that it's very different, but I'm so anti-Snape. <laughs> So he's not just, he's not the Snape that you know, okay? He's the Snape that okay. exists in the mind of the Snape wives. Okay? He's not real Snape, I promise you. He's like the Snape we wish we had. Maybe maybe that'll maybe maybe we could figure out something uh, <laughs> to make me read it. And that can be a goal or something. And uh I will give a full review one day <laughs> it's, it's good okay it's good but if you don't have time to to read it or you just you just want to catch the vibes strange aeons video is a decent substitute um but i do recommend the book itself actually uh I just, it's good i just need to i just need to clarify something i'm not a snape hater i just hope snape never felt joy in his life because he what's didn't. the difference <laughs> i don't know I feel like it just it's less controversial. Yeah. (laughs) It's fine. It's fine. Listen, so many people hate the things that I love. And I guess I can say this. You know what? I'll say this. We're seven books in now. I hate Snape. I hate Snape. Wow. Stabbed in the heart. Just gutted. (sighs) Should be. This is a surprise to everybody. Can you love a character and hate them at the same time? Yes, you can. You can. Yeah. Oh, I feel that all the time. Klaus <laughs> Michelson, uh, Draco Malfoy, mm. uh, Damien or D- Damon from House of Dragon. That's the current one. Love it. So good. Cersei from the original Game of Thrones. Mm. Hate, hate, hate to love them. What mm-hmm. I feel for Snape is not that. I just hate him. <laughs> I'm controversial. (laughs) Let's answer this question. When y'all play in the new Hogwarts game. Okay. Here's the deal with that. Here's the deal with that. It looks so good, you guys. It looks looks so good. And it breaks my heart how good it looks. Like I saw a little video of the character creator. And oh my God, it looks so good. It looks like you could totally be gay in the game and everything. And like... It just brings all the joy. I used to play all the video games, like all the computer PC games, and I loved them so much as a kid. And it mm-hmm. brings it brings all that joy and nostalgia back to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Only this one looks like really good. Those other Harry Potter games, I played them all too. They're not any good, um, but this one looks really good. They were Don't the best Harry Potter yourself. game is the Lego ones, anyways. The Lego ones were spectacular. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I really, really want to, but the thing is, is I was starting to get hype for it. I was like really starting to get hype for it. And then JK Rowling made her little tweet about how she sleeps on a bed of money and she doesn't give a fuck about anything else. And I just, it just kind of like took all the wind out of my sails. You know what I mean? Cause I, I think things like, like, Oh, I can do this. And if I like 
um, stream it and, and we'll do like a fundraiser stream and then I can morally feel okay about it and not, you know, feel gross about playing the game. Um, but then she tweets that shit and I'm just like, I, I'm not big enough to do a big enough fundraiser to not make me feel gross about it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just not. And I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I want to, and I don't want to at the same time. I'm not, I'm trying to not think about it too hard. You know what I mean? Try to not think about it too hard. I'm I'm gonna play and beat Pokemon. That might keep my attention long enough to where I kind of miss the Harry Potter game train, and I'm okay with that. I kind of want to miss the Hogwarts Legacies game train and just and just not even hop on the train. And I was like, oh well, everyone else is so far in the game, and I'll and I'll be behind. So why would I want to play? And and then I can just be like, oh, that's okay. I don't care anymore. So I don't know, Blue. I have two minds about it. It's a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Landon, you're not much of a gamer, but I'm sure you've seen the coverage. Yeah, I mean, it's easy for me to ignore games because I'm not a gamer. Uh, but I really want to play this game. I'm not going mm-hmm. to, but I really want to. Um, so I'll just, you know play D D instead because that's what i do with my life <laughs> get it on a hot steam sale yeah like maybe maybe once it goes on a steam sale where it's like you know 15 bucks or something and yeah i don't know i don't know i have a lot I of feelings i mean if we really want to to like the the way that i so this is my rule just on a personal level um if i am going to buy anything that is official harry potter or is going to give jkr anything mm-hmm. um I need to pay that same amount of money to an organization that helps trans youth. Yeah. So it'd be like, hey, if I buy this game, then donate the same amount of money to Trevor yeah. Project or something like that uh, to kind of re- reparations <laughs> my way. Blue, <laughs> Blue is trying to troll you so hard right now, Landon, like so hard. <laughs> Snape was the decent teacher. Shut up, Blue. No one thought that. I love him. No one, but no one thought that. <laughs> we just, we just thought, we just wanted a, a bad boy, and we thought Alan Rickman was sexy as fuck. That's what we thought. Okay, you guys, like that's what we thought. <laughs> I think I also couldn't, like, yes, Alan Rickman, fairly attractive man, right? But like, I couldn't get over the fact that Snape was supposed to be thirty years old. <laughs> <laughs> And Alan Rickman barely looked 30 when he was 30. (laughs) Yeah, he didn't. But he he always looked kind of old. (laughs) But he was like 65. Like I was like, I can't, I can't do, I can't do that. (laughs) Oh my word. Okay. Well, if you want, if you listen, we can have this debate. (laughs) Not right now, but we can have this debate at some point in time. And Mm -hmm. I would love to listen to your arguments and turn down every single one of them because one of my best friends is Karen. And she is a snake wife. Like pretty much, I was there for that. <laughs> I was there for that, and I fully support she said it proudly that she was there for the snake wife. Yeah. I yeah. we just listen. I love a dubious character. I love a terrible person with no redeeming qualities. I truly, truly do. I just can't get behind Snape. It's one. It's just that one character. And it makes me unpopular. Oh, lady fine. was a Snape wife <laughs> too. She says she meowed at me. I don't know if you guys could pick that up on the mic, but she says hello, everybody. She says hi. I was a Snape wife too. I, yeah, I'm only yeah. like one years old, but I'm totally here for this. Um, mm. Now you have to read Harry Potter, but you have to read Harry Potter uh, for free on the internet. Call it fan fiction. Yeah, there you go. You can find audiobooks of it on YouTube for real. That's true. That's what, that's what, that's what Karen did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah. Um, okay. We, we've reached the end of our topics um, today. I think it's time for the good news article. Are, do you agree, Landon? Is that okay? Are we I good to agree. that? Okay. Let me go switch it over so that um, everybody can see the good news article and we'll talk good about news it. news article. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's do, give me one second, you guys, to kind of get this going. Uh, there we go. That looks good. That looks good. Uh, there we, we go. Okay, everybody can see. I was going to say, we <gasps> discovered a problem, and that's that no gay news comes in the month of October, because only gay things happen in June, as every good gay person knows. But mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. did happen in October, and that is mm-hmm. Mexico legalized 
gay marriage and queer marriage in all of its states, mm-hmm. uh, which is amazing and a right step forward. <laughs> uh, Mexico's politics have, uh, you know, are, it's a country that is deeply religious mm-hmm. um, and has a lot of ties to Catholicism and Protestant uh, beliefs. And so a lot, like many other Latin countries, a lot of uh, gay marriage is not legal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the government felt that this is what is meant to happen. And it's always important to celebrate because there are so many so many countries around the world that still have either it is illegal, like truly, truly illegal to be gay or don't have legalized same sex marriage. And um, it's important to celebrate when a country overturns that mm-hmm. and takes a step into uh, open acceptance and love. Yeah, I think a lot of us that live in um, in the more progressive areas of uh, of Europe and uh, in the U.S. and Australia, and New Zealand, I know that's where most of my viewers are. Is in one of those one of those three places I just list, and tend to be living in more progressive areas. Not always, um, but we tend to forget like that it is truly still um, like explicit bigoted stuff goes on in a lot of other countries. So we just wanted to highlight that. Hey, Mexico get it did it too. And so this article is pretty short, so I'm just going to read it. Um, lawmakers in the border state of I should have pre-read this so that I could actually know how to pronounce this. Tamaulipas, I think this is Tamaulipas, Mm -hmm. voted Wednesday night to legalize same-sex marriages. This was published on October 27th, okay? So this was at the very end of October. Halloween present for everybody. Um, Halloween's the gay holiday, so, you know, good for Mexico. Um, Becoming the last of Mexico's 32 states to authorize such unions. So good job, um, Tamaulipas. The measure to amend the state civil code passed with 23 votes in favor, 12 against. Love that spread. That's great. 23 to 12. Wow. Setting off cheers of yes, we can from the supporters in of the change. The session took place as groups both for and against the measure chanted and shouted from the balcony and legislators eventually moved to another room to finish their debate and vote. Uh, The president of the Supreme Court, Arturo um, Zaldivar, I think is how you say his name. A watch, welcome the vote. The whole country shines with a huge rainbow. Li- live in dignity and rights of all people. Love is love, he said on Twitter. A day earlier, lawmakers of the southern state of Guero approved similar legislation allowing same-sex marriage. In 2015, the Supreme Court declared state laws preventing same-sex marriage unconstitutional, but some states took several years to adopt the laws confirming with the ruling. Okay, so... This is great news. So there is nowhere in Mexico that you cannot have a same sex marriage. So good job, Mexico. I I love this stuff. You know, um, there's a lot of doom and gloom going on right now, especially politically and economically in the world. So it is nice to remember that um, we are still moving towards a better world overall, maybe not year to year. Okay. Mm -hmm. But like overall, we are moving in a better direction with more equity for everybody. And this is uh, proof of that. It's good to remember that these things happen. Good things happen. It is. Yeah. And it's important to remember that. And um, it's important to celebrate. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you have the privilege, and like Karen said, most viewers who are watching this c- come from a place where you can, and it is legal to, uh, love someone that you love uh, make sure to appreciate that for not only yourself but if you're not queer then for your friends and family who are uh and to strive to be a part of places that continue to push that goal forward mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yes yes um if not all of us then none of us and we have to keep fighting until everyone has the human rights that they deserve so very, very good news. All right. Let's do our outro. All right, Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, currently, my Twitter is overrun with Taylor Swift stuff because I did not get tickets <gasps> like most of uh, America. So I'm we're so sad. It's okay. Um, I'm gonna go to Europe instead, I think. Uh oh, sad that it's the well, same price. <laughs> that actually that sounds just... way more fun though. I mean, I I I'm sure a Taylor Swift concert is fun, but like that sounds amazing. 
yeah, I'm sad, but I'm I'm very excited to possibly go to Europe. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. and uh but that's what my Twitter is. My Instagram is uh just a lot of chaos. So come follow me and enjoy whatever content I bring to the table. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Where can you find me? You can find me in all of these places. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter for my latest updates. That's like the main place to follow me to kind of know what's going on in my world. You can do that between now and whenever um, Aramai Muskrat kills the app. Um, I do have a backup Tumblr, which is pinned at the top of my Twitter. If Twitter actually does die, that's where I'll be going. Um, Unless plans change, we'll see. If you would like to make sure that you get good notifications every time we go live, every time I post a video, then you want to be in my Discord. So you can join that for that. I post almost all my VODs on YouTube. You can follow my YouTube to find all that past content that we keep referencing in our videos. And um, here's how you can support me. Here's all all the ways that you can support us here uh you can that's not the right command that's the right command okay you can subscribe right here on twitch we also have a merch store you can donate via tips and i have a throne wish list as well so you can do all of those things if you like um we are actually taking a week break for thanksgiving next so we will be back on December the 3rd with our community day Stardew Valley stream. If you're interested in joining us for Stardew Valley, then you want to hop in that discord and you want to get the farmer role. Okay. That's how you can do that. If you would like to participate, uh, I will also be doing my thank you for 300 followers stream next Sunday. We're going to be making some slime. You guys, we're going to return. I've been practicing. We've got some better recipes, uh, some, some, some big girl adult Uh, slime recipes that will actually stay together and work and not, you know, go crazy after only a week. So uh, so I'm going to show them to you. And that is my thank you for 300 followers stream. We're going to do, it's going to be an ASMR thing. It's going to be really fun. Uh, So we'll do that. And um, okay. I think it's also, I also want to say something that I think it's important to note that something important is happening between this ESW episode and next ESW episode. Your girl's turning 29, so come back on the 3rd to come celebrate me, because I want to see the applauses. Yes, we'll be saying a big happy birthday to Landon on the next ESW episode, since we always take the uh, Thanksgiving week off, so we tell her happy birthday on the the 1st December episode. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So if you want to say happy birthday to Landon, make sure you come and join for that Stardew Valley stream and tell her happy birthday. It'll be fun. It'll be super fun. Okay. All right. Yes, birthday. Um, Also, we do have uh, birthday shout outs in the Discord. So if you want to make sure you remember to tell Landon happy birthday on her birthday, then you want to get in the Discord. Okay. Here we go. Let's raid. We're going to raid into Wabsuit. He is playing Pokemon Scarlet and Violet right now, just like I'm about to go do. I got to go do a couple chores and I'm going to play Pokemon. If you would like to play with me, um, I'm going to also create a VC, I think, in the Discord. So you want to hop on the Discord for that. But uh, for those of you that don't have the game, we're going to go watch Wabsuit play it. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Bye, everybody. See you after Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye.